Welcome to episode 65 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is part one, Discussion with a Progressive. If you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen me mention some of my progressive friends. One in particular is at my house most Friday nights. We enjoy dinner, drinks, many political conversations. It often includes a cigar, and sometimes it goes until the wee hours of the morning. Our conversations, they're awesome. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't but we both feel that the other frequently makes great points. I asked my friend Steve if he would be willing to record one of those conversations, and he agreed. It ended up being an hour and a half shortened only because of a technical difficulty. With that, let's go ahead and dive right into the first half. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Liberty Dad here, and I happen to have a good friend of mine. If you follow me on Twitter, you know that there's a mysteri this mysterious person that I reference, my progressive friend. And I thought, you know what? One, how many people actually believe that I have this mysterious progressive friend? And then two, wouldn't it be great to record some of the conversations that we have because we have many great conversations? So what he has done is he has graci graciously uh, decided that he would be on camera, record our conversation, and we'll just see where it goes. now. The, we have not nothing is scripted. We have not sat down and we did not sit and say, should we talk about this topic? Should we talk about that? None of that stuff. We're just going to dive right in and have our normal conversation to the best that we can. We, of course, know that we're on film, so that will change the dynamic a little bit. But otherwise, we're going to have a normal conversation. So with all that, let me introduce my friend, Steve. Steve, how do you do? Good evening, Dio. All right. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> so... Folks, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we are going to kind of just focus on each other. So we may not look at the camera much because we're not talking to you. We are talking to each other. And the purpose of this is to give people an idea of how conversations, everyday conversations, can and maybe even should go. So the first thing I want to ask you, Steve, and for the first few moments, it may be a little bit less dialogue and more like talking, kind of knowing that we have an audience. But... I refer to you as my progressive friend. Is that a fair assessment of you? I guess I feel like the progressive label was applied to me. Okay. Maybe against my, against my request or desire. Um, I definitely have some progressive views, but there's other areas. In some areas I have progressive views, but there's other areas where my views are probably not progressive or less than progressive. Right. Um, I consider myself very middle of the road, but I tend to be left of center for most of the people that I know in Florida. So, yeah, I guess progressive does apply. Gotcha. Okay, fair enough. Is is there a word that you tend to use yourself? Centrist. centrist? I consider myself a centrist. I don't like I like to look at what's happening, judge it against my own experience and make a decision on its own merits. Gotcha. I tend to fall my opinions tend to run left of, of center America, but um, not that far. So any idea how you got there? Um, I'd say some of it's upbringing. Okay. Um, my dad was a union man. I'm a manager, and that has led to some epic arguments between the two of us until we agreed not to discuss it. <laughs> um, but because he doesn't see things the way that I do, um, but I have a military background. I have a deep, I feel like a deep understanding of history, um, and I believe very, very strongly in what I would call the American experiment, and what the ex I consider it an experiment. I consider it something that is ongoing and subject to change as we continue to grow, and I don't believe that, in. I perceive a conservative viewpoint as being uh, upholding the past and what was already done as being a fundamental part of a conservative viewpoint and making, if changes need to be made, make them in a very limited way, right? Okay. Whereas a true 
liberal or progressive viewpoint tends more, in my opinion, to ignore the past in favor of making changes that sometimes in a look before you leap methodology. Okay. Um, that doesn't really work. I do believe that change is necessary. Like the world changes, we change, um, people change, technology changes. So to stagnate isn't going to work. Right. But look <clears throat> before you leap also isn't going to work. Yeah. And so that leads me to describe myself as a centrist. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, as you know, I'm libertarian. Yes. Uh, all the way, every day, uh, sometimes maybe, uh, maybe a little too much for some people, and that's fair. Um, and I think a lot of that is just, you know, kind of how you have that conversation with other people. Because I, I tend to believe, and, and correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, but I tend to believe that even if you have a radical idea, as long as it's not like extremely radical, like if we say, hey, we want to kill everybody that's under five foot three, and I say that because I'm five foot three, <laughs> right? If we want to kill everybody that's under five foot three, you know, that's an extremely radical idea. Um, and, and, and we're disregarding whether or not there's any good or bad, in, in, you know, behind it. We're just saying it's an sure. extremely radical. Uh, because so few people would actually say, yeah, you know what, that might be a good idea. So I guess my question is, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, th th these kind of ideas, um, man, I lost my train of thought. This is great. So I'm going to have to break the fourth wall, folks. <laughs> I want to point out, we have both been drinking, and unlike most of my episodes, this one may have some Only profanity, and it may have some from me, which you may be unaccustomed to. And you're going to find that I lose my train of thought a little bit more because I'm a, a, a few sockies in, so I just want to point that out. So I forgot where I was going with that question, <laughs> which is, which okay. is funny uh, because it's, it's, not, it's not typical uh, with me. But um, th th this particular one I did. Of course, you know, when you're on camera, all of a sudden everything changes. You're like, oh, my God, I'm on camera. You know, everybody's watching me, even though, like, nobody's watching me right now. I could edit all of this out and look really, really smart, <laughs> but I'm not going to. Uh, so we, you, you were saying a moment ago. You were talking about radical ideas. Oh, yeah, radical. Yeah, 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 that's where I was going. So, I, you know, I tend to have radical ideas from other people, but I feel like they're not extreme radical. You know, like, hey, we want to kill all, right. all these people, you know. So I have these radical ideas, and we talk about them all the time. Yes. And... When we have a conversation about some of my more radical ideas, how do you tend to feel? Like, are you just like, dude, you're crazy? Or are you like, uh, sometimes? Okay, sometimes. All right. Uh, it, is it a lot? I don't no. know. Like, okay. No, fair there's places. I mean, you know, there's places that we that we disagree and have agreed to disagree, right? Right. Um, and I do think that some ideas that are presented, uh, in any conversation, like the ones that we have, like some ideas are radical. Right. Right. But I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with a radical idea. Radical ideas made this country great. Like, we're going to go to the moon. Right. That's a radical idea. We're going to try democracy on for size. That's a radical idea. Right? We're going to try and do this thing in the world because of what we believe in. That's a radical idea. I'm not saying all those ideas were right. I'm not even saying that all those ideas had the, thing, had the results that we expected when they started but they were radical ideas. And right. I think that radical ideas today or tomorrow need to be examined and sometimes tried on some sort of scale. Um, I do, I think that radical ideas, the, the, the ideas that come across as radical uh, that I disagree with the most are the ones that I feel like we already tried. Okay. I think those are the ones that challenge me the most to examine my own perspective. Right. And to try and articulate that perspective to other people. Okay. So, do you, do you have an example? Um. Yeah, I mean, like we talk a lot about free market. Okay. And I and I think you know my position on this is that there's you know if we look at the history of the American economy or the world economy, there are plenty of examples of free market in in a subset of the entire market. Right. And and I certainly understand some of your points on that um but i would say that overall and we were we were talking about this a little earlier um from a free market perspective i think 
a true free market is a is a difficult argument to make with respect to in in a in a true capitalist society what that means for its for its citizenry okay i think there is a responsibility for a regulated market i think it's healthy to discourse and disagree and determine what the right level of regulation is right but i think a truly unregulated market is actually dangerous not just to itself but to the people that live in that environment and to the nation states that are that adhere to that um and i think we've demonstrated that over time right and so i would characterize some of those points not all of them as being more radical from my perspective and i gotcha. have to examine those closely because you've raised some very good points that have made me think over the over our discussions gotcha I, I was trying to look up something that i had recently said just to see where that fits in the idea of radical and for whatever reason i don't seem to be coming across it it was something that i said on twitter um and i think it's actually pretty radical and i think you'll actually disagree and so i um uh, that actually there's there's probably quite a few but there was one okay. in specific that i was actually looking for here so i'm gonna find it oh i think i found it okay we're we're close here um let's see here and okay so i actually didn't say this but i responded to it so there was a tweet by the libertarian party of new hampshire now as you know the libertarian party is very decentralized so the local parties have a lot of autonomy in what they can say. The state parties have a lot of autonomy in what they right. can say, and the national party uh, as well. And that, that that tends to lead to a lot of disagreement between us because, you know, somebody in some other state might say, hey, you know, what what you just tweeted, what you just said, um, you know, kind of looks bad on, a ball, on, on all of us. And one of my big issues has been not so much the idea and not, not always the presentation mm -hmm. but the follow-up you know and i'll give you a really interesting example and i think this applies very well to like affiliates and people in general right okay. when my little my little brother is 12 years younger than me so i remember when you know he was a toddler and he would run across the room and he would trip and fall and maybe bump his head on the wall right he would immediately turn to everybody else and he would look and <laughs> our watching? response <laughs> literally it was crazy because if we were like oh my god are you okay yep. he would start wailing and crying yep but if we were like ha 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 that's funny right then he would start laughing as well yep and toddlers and, can and, be and, remarkably and, resilient yeah and and as a dad I'm, I'm noticing a very similar trend with my son um now he's my my, my son is maybe less gullible <laughs> Fair. right because sometimes he starts crying before i had a chance to be like hey oh it's okay no or even if i'll even sometimes he'll turn and look and i'll be like oh dude you're all right and then he'll be like Bleh! you know they get upset so it doesn't always work on him um but i feel like that there's kind of like this similarity with the libertarian party in, in that decentralization where if one party or one member says something that other members are like dude, you're cramping our style, you know, right. you're cramping our political style in a sense, right? Right. And I, 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 I'm not so sure that is good because I feel like what that does is that's the signal to the outside world that they should equally be horrified or, 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 or bothered by whatever was said, right? Okay. I think I'm tracking. And, it, you know, so, so basically my little brother is other libertarians and I'm sorry, let me get that let me get this analogy correct here. So my little brother would be libertarian A, right. who says or does a thing, right? And then the parents or whomever is watching is libertarian B, who responds, right? Right. right? But instead of necessarily libertarian A being the recipient of that response, it's the outside world, right? It's the the people who are maybe Democrats and Republicans and so on and so forth, right? right. And so they're the ones that that largely will respond in in, in okay. part, not in full, right? And I think that one, in the same way that I might say, laugh it off to my son or w when we did it to my little brother, we don't necessarily laugh it off in the Libertarian Party. We just have a different response. Your, your response is different, so that those that are looking in say, oh. Okay, that is kind of radical. I see. I see what they're saying. Right. Right. So here's this radical thing that was said. Sorry. 
So the Libertarian Party okay. of New Hampshire, they recently tweeted out, it was like a day ago, there was a New York Times article and the title said, the Biden administration will use federal civil, federal civil rights office to deter states from banning universal masking in classrooms. Okay. Now, I didn't read the article, so I don't know what the details are, but we're just going on the... the uh, I'm also not familiar the, the, with the position. The, okay. Right, the title here. And so what it sounds like is that they're going to use civil rights legislation at a federal level to impose upon states and say, this is why you cannot ban masking in classrooms. Okay? Okay. Now, we don't have to agree upon that now. We don't even have to talk about it necessarily. Right. We, I, I haven't even read the article, neither have you. Right. But here's what was said. One line. Repeal the Civil Rights Act. Um. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess... Go all out or I, not, I was right? Say, right? Yeah, I mean, so I... I, I uh, Is that radical or extreme? It's radical. Okay, fair enough. It's pretty radical. Okay. So, so the way that I perceive that, first of all, um, I think I want to. I'm going to set aside for a moment the internal conversation for the Libertarian Party. I think it's healthy for any party to have an internal discourse to arrive at its, at its position. Sure. Okay. And I do think that every like the Democrats, the Republicans do have those in, internal discourses, possibly less publicly. I'm not sure that it truly is less public. Um, depending on the forums that you follow, if, but if you watch like the conventions and stuff like that and the, and the process that leads up to any of the conventions, right? I think you get a, a window into some of that discourse and I think all of the parties have it. And if you look at the history of the, of the major parties, like they've completely flipped on major issues over their history to right. the extent that, you know, when people start talking about those histories, they can talk in very derogatory terms about the current party failing to recognize that like the party has deliberately moved away from some of those positions and right. that happens on both sides for the majors um i think the libertarian party my understanding of its history is it's younger so it doesn't have that background but let's say let's focus on the on the declaration that re repeal the civil rights act is the right answer here um i'm gonna put this as an analogy in in as a project manager um you know a lot of times we're approaching different things we're we're trying to implement something that hasn't been done before or do something in a new way that's the nature right. of the projects that i tend to take on and sometimes something will go wrong in that process for whatever reason and then somebody in the room will say well we need to change this right we need to stop doing this thing and I always have to take a look at that, and, and they usually want this, I'm like, I look at that like, if you give somebody a hammer, then all the world is a nail. Right. Right? You're, you're, you're using a sledgehammer to solve a problem that needs a scalpel, right? Or a, or a, a um, you know, a, a, a tap, not a, not mm -hmm. a broad swing. And... I think that's that's one of my big difficulties with where we are today in all in a lot of our discourse even in in citizens that aren't politically active they tend to want to use a sledgehammer for everything like repeal the civil rights act well the civil rights act is as I understand it I haven't read the thing in its entirety but it's a long document right right and there's a lot of history behind it and there's a lot of reasons that it was passed and there's a lot that goes into that and it is shaped fundamental aspects of our society for dozens of years right right and to just wipe that out and think we're going to start with a clean slate it feels like shooting from the hip it's not a plan it's a it's a sledgehammer okay right and and i would rather say not knowing what the actual position of the administration is if I disagree with the position of the administration and how they're using a law, right, then instead of just blanket repealing the law as being our first go-to, mm -hmm. I'm not ruling it out, but it, it, should it be our first go-to or should we first say, mm, I'm not sure that law was intended to do that, and should we maybe pass a bill to rewrite certain sections of it? To specify that it's not intended to do this thing, right? That it's given too much power 
to the executive branch or too little clarity to the right. judicial branch, that's the legislative branch's responsibility and the people's responsibility to say, let's make a change. Gotcha. Right? And, and so while I won't rule out repealing any act for any reason, I would say it shouldn't be the first answer every time. Okay. So let me let me push back a little bit. Let me let me suggest that maybe it's not really the first answer. It's more a response that has been given in some corners. Right. But not really publicly you know, not really had a public conversation about it, right? Right. And so so one of my responses to that was to point out that um, I was a bit snarky about it. And I pointed out, I said, you know, a lot of white people are going to be like, what? How could you do that? You know? And then I pointed out, I said, I think a lot of people, they don't have to be white. Right. <laughs> and then I said, but some black economists who lived during that time mm -hmm. have made that very case. There's two that I can come like, to mind. Yep. Um, uh, one specifically, Walter Williams, he's since passed away. He has made the case, and he outright said, I mean, you can, you can find video clips of him. He's outright said, the Civil Rights Act was a mistake. Okay. Flat out. Right. The other one, I haven't seen anything that's been so definitive. Right. But I have seen some serious criticisms of the Civil Rights Act from him. Now. There are the, critiques of. Right. And the challenge that I get is that I'm almost white, so a lot of people see me as white. And so when I make these kind of conversations, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, of course you're, you're white enough or you're white, depending right. on who they are. And so therefore, you know, you, you just don't understand. Um, and then if I present the arguments from these right. two black economists, it's like, oh, well, you just went out and found some black guys that really like or that are espousing what you believe. And I'm like, well, that seems pretty racist because I've actually learned quite a bit from both of these two gentlemen. Right. right? Like I've... I would love to have the just intellectual powerhouse that either one of these two men have. Sure. And I can assure you right now, <laughs> on camera, I don't have it. Right. I would love it. It would right. be fabulous. And I've learned so much from them. And I remember when I first heard the arguments, I was like, really? And, I, and, and, and honestly, uh, I'll be honest, I was like, you know, as a person who, is, who does not identify as a black person, um, and, and, I, and I say that I don't identify right. one is because... Um, in, in conversations that we've had before, and just for people that are maybe watching in uh, or listening, if you're listening on audio, I, uh, I, you know, I have had members of the black community who have been like, no, you could totally pa pass for a black person. And I'm like, really? Right. And they're like, yeah. You know, it's, so it's very interesting. But, but I've never identified as a black person. So it really mm -hmm. kind of threw me back because I was like, why would a black person say that? Like, that sounds crazy, you know? Right. But then I started hearing some of the things that they were saying. So like Walter Williams. His argument is, hey, look, the only thing that really needs to happen is we just simply need to say every single person, no matter what skin color they are, no matter what shade it is, they need to have um, equality under the law, period. That's it. This is really all you got to say. Like, you get equality. You don't have to go out and write a Civil Rights Act specifically for a particular group. You just need to say, look, everybody gets equality, and we are currently not providing it, so therefore we need to resolve that. Right. You don't really need to write another law because effectively for him, we already have them. We already have the laws that say it. we're just not respecting them in the first place. Thomas Sowell, he's a different guy um, from what I've seen and read from him. His argument, he, he has seemed to dig his, or at least from what I've seen of him. I don't know. Both of them may have done it. But what he has seen, uh, done is dug into the data and according to him, you can, if you go back and you look in the data, you see this upward trend before the Civil Rights Act. Right. In, in income I've seen status. That trend. In income status for any black demographic. So you see it for like single black Americans, uh, black American families, uh, men, women. You just see it. Now, it's not like this huge, it's not like all of a sudden, right. you know, we're not talking that, hey, before the Civil Rights Act, everybody was equal income wise. What he's saying is you already see a, a trend upwards before right. the Civil Rights Act even occurred, before it was ever written. And then he says after the Civil Rights Act, 
there's a little bit more up, but then it kind of plateaus, plateaus. and then it stops. And I think somewhere in the 70s is when he says, you basically stop seeing that same upward trend. And then you start seeing a downward trend. Right. And then he also makes the case, he says, you know, and both of them have actually made this case. They'll say that the black family remained largely intact. You know, a mother, father, uh, children. You sure. know, the, the, they're stereotypical, the, the uh, nuclear family, if you will. Uh, they, they generally remain intact without any major problems until sometime after the Civil Rights Act. And according to Sowell, what, what has happened is that you've incentivized behavior that was destructive to the family okay. right? by specifically pointing toward a particular group effectively, right? Right. And so that, that tends to be his argument. And so I look at it and I say, but, but these men, these, these guys have been making this, I mean, Walter Williams has since passed away. He passed away like six or eight months ago, something like mm -hmm. that, I think. And then um, Thomas Sowell is still alive, and he's like in his, I, I, I want to say he's in his early 90s, but he might be late 80s. Sure. Uh, but both of them, uh, Walter Williams was in his 80s. When he passed away, he was like 83 or 84 or something like that. And so both of them, they were born in like the, the 30s or so, you right. know. And they were young men at right. the time of the Civil Rights Act. And they were academics, and they both have stories about how what we would consider now to be racist shaped their lives to make them who they were. And, and, and from my perspective, intellectual powerhouse. Right. Um, and so, I, you know, going back to what you originally were saying, it feels like it feels like a lot of people think it's a new idea, but it's really just a, an idea that hasn't been broadcasted publicly and given a lot of thought and consideration sure. you know um now in this particular case i don't think that the you know i don't I, i'm not going to speak for the libertarian party of new hampshire who posted it but uh based on the, the clip that they provided which was that new york times article <clears throat> my guess is what kind of drove this particular tweet in specific was hey we're using this law to now bully states which was not in the intention right it wasn't like because they're talking about like masking and and right you know what you can do and so it's like well wait a minute this was specifically you know about minorities and people who were being treated unfairly and that's putting it way lightly <clears throat> right, right? And it's putting that that is very much putting it lightly. So it feels like what's happened is that the Civil Rights Act now is being weaponized to say, oh, states, you want to have some autonomy in this particular area that we disagree with? Well, how about this? Does that sound fair? Um, like, like, a, like a fair argument to you, or does it sound like, ah, you're stretching it? I well, mean, I mean, so I, I first I have to say, I'm I'm not an expert in the Civil Rights Act, and I'm not an expert in the writings of either of these two individuals. Right. Um, I'm somewhat. I have some exposure to some of the ar arguments. I guess I won't even say that I have a that I'm familiar. I will say this. <clears throat> um, I fundamentally agree with the idea that if we treat everybody equally under the law, without reservation then we wouldn't need things like the Civil Rights Act. Right. I don't think we'd disagree if I say that there's evidence that not many laws are applied equally to everybody. And I'm, I'm going to expand that to all the laws. Um, you know, well-connected people don't have the law applied the same way to people that are less connected. Right. People that have a grounding and an understanding in the law those laws apply, are going to be applied differently. They can mount a better defense or right. a better offense within the scope of any one of those laws. Um, I also don't understand, like I'm not familiar with exactly how the administration intends to weaponize the law. I have some questions about how you can actually use the Civil Rights Act to enforce states. I'm, I'm, 
kind of not clear on where they're going to take that. Right. I'd like. I guess I'd be. I'd be interested to see how that's supposed to work. Right. And we don't. Um, have, we don't have to discuss yeah, yeah. the merits of that. Right. So I. But I think. I think I still hold by my my original assertion. You know, repealing the law is not off the table. It's never off of the table. Okay. Right. But should it be the first action that's taken? I'm less convinced. Okay. Right. What are we really trying to achieve? What were we trying to achieve in passing the law in the first place? What are we trying to achieve in how we're using it today? And where is the law falling short? Why isn't there another law that covers what the government needs, feels it needs to do? Right. Why is wearing a mask, for example, is it necessary that that be a political conversation or is that a science conversation is another question that I have, right? Right. Because I'm fundamentally, I'm going to turn to science almost all the time. And that's one of the reasons that I get labeled as a progressive because I tend to look toward how science is going to deal with it and less toward how people are going to deal with it. And that's a shortcoming of science, right? Science doesn't always take into account people. Right. Um, but that's also a shortcoming of law is that it doesn't always take into account people. And so I would say, you know, should we think about it? Yeah, it should be on the table. Gotcha. But should it be our first step? No, probably not. Like, especially if we decide that there are things that are beneficial from the law, right? right? And if we decide that maybe we need to decide that the law was poorly written to, to achieve its goals and we can modify parts of the law. It seems like the goal of the law, at least the way it was sold, mm -hmm. whether true or not in the actual writing, is that it would enforce a more equal treatment under the law for disadvantaged individuals of any of any minority right right um so i think again to answer the question of like does my opinion change because these two individuals hold this position no two individuals don't get to make that decision we live in a democracy right okay we live in a world where a lot of people are affected by any change that we make and we need to account for those interest groups. Um, we need to account for how some of them are going to suffer and how some of them are going to gain when we take right. any action. Maybe it is a good answer, but I would say, surely, we could take other steps first. Right. Like, a blanket repeal of an act that so um, changed the discourse of American politics and, and American law in our business and our, our personal environment, um, I would say that comes with a high risk. Okay. And I don't like risk. So I would say I would rather approach that with a scalpel than a sledgehammer. Okay. I would rather look at specific elements of the law and say, we've changed. We're not 1960s America anymore. Okay. Right? Surely we have the tools within our government to make changes, to change the way we interpret the law, to change the way that we enforce the law. Mm -hmm. And I think, and, and you asked, is it okay for the federal government to weaponize a law, right? I would argue that laws are weaponized at every level and that that's a fundamental part of a law. Like we don't pass a law because we think that, we usually don't pass laws because just for the sake of getting them on the books. Right. They're intended when they're passed, to be used to achieve a certain goal. And is it fair to say that, as a rule of thumb, a law is passed to either prevent people from doing something that they otherwise would do, or to force them to do something they otherwise would not? Not always. Okay. What's not, the not always? Like other, mm -hmm. The other thing that a law can do is it can open up avenues that didn't previously exist. Okay, so and help can, me understand that one. So it can, a law can, for example, we could we could pass a law, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, well, we could pass a law that changes how, um, how rental properties are administered. Okay. Okay, that might, like today, I know that there's a lot of discourse that, you know, you're familiar with, in like the Airbnb environment and the gig economy, mm -hmm. right? And there's laws that restrict how those entities operate. Some of those laws have elements of protectionism in them. In them. Some of those laws were designed in an environment where that wasn't 
possible, okay. right? Like we start talking talking about um, like housing and and transport laws and stuff like that. Nobody thought about the idea of an Uber, right? right. Nobody thought about the idea of an Airbnb. Nobody. Those laws were written before the internet, right? Right. Our world has changed. We need new laws to address those changes, whether those laws are to clarify that you do in fact have the right to do this, right, and that a local government can't overstep its boundaries and, and restrict it unnecessarily. Um, that opens up new opportunities, new business gains. So new... how do we identify when a new law is necessary? Discourse like this. Because like that's easy. It, it feels to me like what ends up happening is you have a, um, you have an event that occurs and that event then generates some momentum to say, we need to protect other people from experiencing this event. We do that too much. But the problem tends to be, in my opinion, we do this with events that aren't really that frequent. Agreed. But the, the conversation makes it sound like, oh my God, we better do this. You know, like, and, and, and I feel like most of the laws that are the most easiest to identify are any one that has somebody's name attached to them. You know, even if it's like, oh, only in like a colloquial sense, right? <clears throat> like <clears throat> Obamacare or the Brady Bill? Is um, that, where, is that Brady, what you're talking like, about? Like, yeah, like the Brady Bill or like, um, man, I'm drawing a blank, but I know there's been a number of bills based on like children. Sure. And they'll have like a child's Amber's. name, you know, Amber's law, you know, and, and there are, there are laws and, and I don't know them off the top of my right. head exactly, but I know that when they come across the wire, when I see them in the news and then I go look them up and I read about them, I go, man, that just seems like an event that really doesn't happen that frequently. And I don't know that this law is going to be that useful. Right. And that's <laughs> a, I think that's, I think that's important. So that's important for us to, to discuss at every level in our politics. Um, it's important for people to be informed and involved, right? We've lost a lot of that, that civil, um, not obedience, participation. Okay. We've lost a lot of that direct participation in that a lot of people here, we'll just stay focused on the Civil Rights Act. A lot of people have an idea of what the Civil Rights Act means and what it does and causes and how it affects them personally right. and their environment personally. Very few of them have actually read the law and understand how it's actually applied. Right. Okay. And I think that is a problem. And I do think that, um, I do think that, you know, again, just like repealing a law is a sledgehammer, passing a law can also be a sledgehammer. Okay. Right. You're, if you're passing a law to address a single event, right. And you're and you're wrapping that whole law up in making sure that that event never happens again, but it only ever happened one time, specifically that way. You're probably not doing a very good job of passing a good law. And I do think, like one of the things that I very much respect about the the libertarian position in general, is a questioning attitude towards our laws and a assertion, a strong assertion that we shouldn't pass a law we don't need. I very much respect that, and I do feel like there's a tendency in all of our legislative branches for our legislators to show that they're doing something, right? right. I'm doing this thing, right? and my base is going to like it, and, my, and I'm protecting the interests of the people that elected me. Okay, I mean, that's politics, right? Like, but is it really, healthy? Is it healthy? That's a good question. Is it healthy? Like, sometimes I question, I don't remember how big the federal code is, it's huge. Right. And, and I'm sure that any act that we take, including sitting here at this table and having this conversation under certain circumstances, I'll bet somebody can find a law that says that we like somewhere we're stepping on something. Right. But isn't that part right? of the problem? It is part of the problem. <clears throat> like, so sometimes I question. When I when we say hold our legislators accountable, a lot of people interpret that as they're supposed to take action and pass laws. Right. But. Do we need a law? Or do we have laws that already exist on the books to accomplish what we're trying to achieve that aren't being enforced or are being poorly enforced or are being disproportionately enforced? Right. Right. And I would rather solve that problem than pass a new law. Like to a certain extent, there was a, a long period in my life that I've since moved away from 
where I felt pretty strongly that the best thing that the federal government or any legislature could do was acknowledge the laws that it had and not pass very many new ones. Okay. Right? But I'm still there. Right. Right. <laughs> and I think and I think that's not a, a little that's, bit more than that, but it's I'm not, basically it's not, there. it's not unhealthy, right? Like like should we take our legislators to task for not doing anything? I'm not sure. In some circumstances, you know, I would rather see my legislature, my legislator, I'd rather see my representatives investigate and question the agencies charged with enforcing the laws on the books to find out why they're not being enforced the way we expected them to right. be enforced instead of passing a new law. Because the risk that comes with the risk that comes with repealing a law is unexpected side effects, impact to lots of different people. The risk that comes with passing a law is unexpected side effects, right. impacts to lots of people. <clears throat> we need to pass and repeal and modify our, all of our laws with care. Right. Right. We need to do it in a responsible manner. And I think in a highly politicized environment, um, we don't always do a good job of doing that. And I think that that's a part of its human nature. Like some, in some respects, there's no getting away from that. So right. I would rather, as an engineer and a process manager, I'd rather, a project manager, I'd rather engineer around it, like engineer to expect it. Um, you know, but at the same time, uh, I think it needs to be part of the conversation. Like, is, are these laws necessary? I, right. Like, I think it's responsible to question every law that's passed and say, was that really necessary? Is it going to change how right. the world works? You know, I think this is very similar to the earlier conversation that we were having where I was bitching about <laughs> um, people that I meet that have been trained on some level in Six Sigma, Lean, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily engineering, but mostly those two. And, and, and it's not that, it, you know, it's not that I have an issue with Six Sigma or right. Lean. I think those are some, some great and useful things. But I feel like a lot of people use them as if they're some sort of cure-all. Agreed. You know? and, and I've experienced that where people who were trained, and I am not trained in it, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a, like, I like to think of myself as a smart guy, and I go and I read up, and I'm like, hey, I don't understand why you're trying to use this, and you haven't really made it clear. You don't, you're not really giving me any indication of what we should be expecting out of this. Right. Right. And I feel like laws are kind of similar to that. Like you've got legislators who tend to act like those office personnel who I said, you know, would be quick to jump and be like, hey, we need a fishbone diagram. Now I'm going to break the fourth wall again here. Fishbone diagram for people that are watching that may not know. It's simply if you were to think of a fish as a skeleton and there are certain elements that you would uh, write information about a particular event that occurred. So you, you say, okay, well, here are the things that um, are related to personnel. Here are the things that are related to equipment, so on and right. so forth. And so you have this breakdown. And the idea is that what you do is you you have this fishbone diagram and you, you write all this information um, and then in, in, in these very specific categories. And then it helps lead you to a, a solution or to, or to or to a root cause it's a tool uh, for root cause analysis right it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a tool. legitimate tool for root right cause analysis. right and it's, it's not a bad one but I, I i've experienced people that are like dude we need a fishbone diagram and i'm like okay and and then they fill it out and i'm like looking at it and i'm just like this is all junk like have right. you like are you even familiar with what you're talking about here right you know you you've identified you've you've definitely identified stuff or as they say on the internet those are words, <laughs> um, right? That's about all I can say about right. that, right? And I feel like that's similar to what happens with legislation. People just kind of like, oh, we need a law for this, right? There ought to be a law, right? Right. And um, I guess I look at it in the same way, where the office people that I would deal with sometimes would want to just draw up schematics of you know they're not really schematics but they would you know use all these different tools to draw out elements of a particular event without knowing what they're trying to solve without knowing anything about, anything about the event without having any right. you know any good clear direction of right. what they intend to do it's just and and i feel like their only intention is very similar to people with legislation and they were to say i don't want it to happen again 
without any consideration of is this really a frequently occurring thing that we need to address? I agree. Because one of the arguments that I've made in the past to people, I'm like, you know, just because we make a law about something doesn't necessarily mean that it was actually that necessary. Right. And and I feel like a lot of people feel that certain laws are a lot more necessary than they really are. And that other other elements of society, other solutions would resolve it or at least keep that event kind of low, like very infrequently right. occurring. You know, and, and so that's kind of where I where, where I sit with 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 laws and legislation. You know, and, and I'm not a I'm sympathetic to the idea of no government. I, I, I'm not really on board that humanity is there. So I, I, I you know, I'm, I guess I like to call myself, you know, lately I've been kind of referring to myself as an anarchist at heart, sure. but a minarchist in practice. Minarchist, of course, right. being somebody who wants a, a minimal amount of government, you know, and what does that exactly mean? I don't really know. I, I, you know, I mean, I, there's strong arguments. You know, I might say, okay, well, let's have this, this, and this, and this, and somebody could make some strong, strong arguments against one of those things. Right. And then I might say, well, okay, well, that's a fair point. You know, so I, you know, it's kind of, kind of fuzzy for me in that particular. Right. Area. But I feel like it's the same thing with with these laws. Is you know, people just they're doing something, and and I feel like the population <clears throat> tends to support it because I remember arguments with some friends during Bush's tenure as president, right. and they would say, this is the two. most do-nothing Congress. And I would be like, that sounds great. Like, the less they do, the worse damage that can happen. Right. Here. For a long you time, know? I felt that a perfectly divided Congress is important. Right. And what's funny is I feel like it tends to go along party lines. So if you're a Republican and you have an overwhelming Democratic Congress, they kind of look forward to a do-nothing Congress. But if right. it's the flip, if you're a Democrat and you have a Republican Congress, you know, pretty much, right. you know, majority Republican where they can basically have their way, then the Democrats are equally like, well, we could we could use the do-nothing Congress right now because then Republicans, they keep passing terrible bills, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. I think... I, and I so, look at it and I say, both of y'all pass right. terrible so, bills. So I, I think that that's a, that's a challenge in the... Um, in the highly politicized environment again, that we've stopped having a healthy discourse and we've started looking for the tweet. We've started looking for the slam, right? We're not actually discoursing over the benefit of a law um, or, or over you know, its, its actual merits or the problem that we're trying to solve. I think in a lot of cases, the laws that Republicans pass, the laws that Democrats pass, if they would take a minute to stop and consider the position of the opposition, mm -hmm. okay, and, and legitimately consider it, not just recognize and discard it, right. okay, like legitimately consider the position of the opposition, we'd get better laws as a result. And I, I you know, there's a golden look back type factor whenever you're looking at history and historic, the great historical debates in Congress. Um, you know where we think that there's in the where these people get together and then they they hammer out a a compromise mm -hmm. right we've stopped compromising and started going to this we have to get a majority so that we can get our job done we can, right. we can throw to our that's wrong it's it's a it's a poor way to govern okay. um it leads to bad laws it leads to um it leads to civil disobedience um, yeah, we talked to about on, that to earlier. Touch, yeah, to touch on an earlier conversation, um, and and I it, I wish, and it's just a wish because in our current environment I don't see how we can get there very easily. That we would start discoursing again because I think that in a lot of these cases these things, the 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 amber the um, I don't know the name of the law specifically, but the law, the amber alert laws, the, the ones that go around that, right? I think people in both parties and regular citizens would agree that the root cause of that law being passed should be prevented. Okay. Right? Um, and I think everybody would agree that we never want this type of thing to happen. Right? And, and 
my under and I don't even have a very good understanding of the law, but my understanding is, you know, a young girl was kidnapped and, and I think murdered. Um, we could always look it up. Yeah, we could. I'll, um, I'll look it up so we're okay. talking intelligently because we are on camera, and yeah. anytime you're on camera, you've got to make sure that you look like you know exactly what you're talking about. But the reality is, this is an everyday conversation. So I'm breaking the fourth wall again here. It's everyday conversation. And sometimes we don't know everything about right. stuff. And that's okay. And I, and I, and, but that shouldn't stop us from having a conversation. And we can make, you know, in, in this particular case, I'm going to look it up. But we can look up something and just kind of get a quick idea just to have that conversation. Because having the conversation is more important than knowing everything about a particular topic. Well, so anyway, back to, and that's, back that's to you, the key. Stan. Like, that, that's, <laughs> that's, and that, that really is the key, though. Like, I wish we would have more discourse about who's going to be positively impacted, who's going to be negatively impacted, how could it be misinterpreted, how could it be weaponized in an mm -hmm. improper way. Um, we need to have those conversations. We need to examine those points of view. We need to decide if that's the, what we actually want to achieve or not. Right. And we need to decide if there's a better way to achieve our goals um, maybe with existing laws or maybe with a, a different amount of force applied or a different statement in right. the law. And I don't, you know, those, those situations always exist. And again, this is why I like to refer to the United States as a, it's an experiment, right? We are an experiment and it is an ongoing experiment. Hey everyone. Sorry for the abrupt cutoff. You know, the reality is when you're having a conversation, there's just not really a good cutoff point where you can just chop it right there and say, all right, here's the first half and here's the second half. So all, all I was able to do is just find a spot and say, this one's going to be it. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you'll tune in to the next episode, part two of Discussion with the Progressive, where you can listen to the rest of the conversation. However, for now, I want you to remember if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.